Hello and welcome back to chapter 15, part two. So in this one, do, 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 do. hold on, going over there. There we go. So in this one, we got done talking about the heart in the last uh, part of this chapter. And um, now we've got to talk about the rest and how we get what the heart pumps, which is, you know, blood and white blood cells and, you know, food and especially the oxygen, blood carrying the oxygen. So all that fun stuff moving around, we need to talk about the pathways they take to get around. And so your main things that are leaving the heart with oxygen rich blood would be your arteries and they get smaller and smaller and smaller on down on the way. And then the ones, the things that carry all the blood back to the heart are your veins. Now, again, as I mentioned, when we were talking about blood, we typically in books and everything like to uh, use the red for arteries and blue for veins. We do it over and over again. And it's because of the misnomer when you look at your arm, if you're pasty pale like myself, and you see blue veins, because these are veins. But the only reason they're blue, I mean, if you open it up, red blood comes out, or if you just, let's just say, we happen to have a magic school bus that I don't have access to right now, which is sad. Of course, I'd rather have a magic school tank, honestly. Um, and, we, and if we went in there, the blood was red. The blood is red no matter what it is. It just gets brighter when it's got oxygen in it than when it doesn't have oxygen in it or it's deoxygenated. So it's fascinating, but what happens is the only wavelength that can actually, light wavelength that actually uh, bounces back to our eyes is blue. So that's why everything but blue gets absorbed. So that's why we see blue. So it looks blue to our eyes because of a trick of the light, but our blood is not really blue. So all those things about saying, yes, I'm a purebred, blue-blooded royalty person type thing, and, and yeah, that doesn't, there is no blue blood. It just looks blue. It's just a trick of the light. Our veins are lying to us, but we still, for whatever, because of this, it's always been shown arteries are red, veins are blue. So if you've ever wondered why, there you go. So anyway, notice we've got to talk about these layers because these things are dealing with a whole lot of pressure, especially the arteries. The arteries deal with the most pressure. The vein is concerned about getting everything back to the heart. We'll talk about how cool he is in a minute. But the artery has a lot more layers than the vein does. So. There's a tunica intima, which is on the inside. Again, we've got the endothelium. It's very slippery and smooth in there, so that way nothing gets caught. That We don't want it to get caught in there. The middle part where the blood flows is called the lumen. Um, then we have a subendothelial layer, and then you have an elastic membrane. Now, this actually is, you find this elastic membrane in the artery, but you don't see it in the veins. You'll see this over and over again. These have, you know, a couple of elastic membranes because the artery is dealing with a lot of high pressure. He's dealing with that high pressure. He has to be able to flex. The veins don't deal with that high pressure. So he doesn't need that flexibility. Doesn't really even enter the vein's brain. Not that the vein has a brain because the vein is, yeah. Just go with me, I think, or not. Anyway, so then you got the middle part, the tunica medica, again, smooth muscles, both of them have it, but again, he's got an external elastic membrane to deal with the pressure, Ve uh, veins don't. And then the third part, again, the outer part is the tunica externa, which are collagen fibers and uh, vascular things because the cells that make this up need to be fed too. So there's a whole bunch of vasa vestorum that feed your own artery and veins so they can, all the layers can keep working and keep the blood flowing. And then it goes down into uh, arterioles, into you know, the capillary network. And we're gonna get into the different layers as it gets smaller and smaller and smaller into a capillary network. And this is where the main gas exchange happens between cells and these capillaries are all over the place, including in the externica of your own arteries and veins. So, so that's one of the major differences between the arteries and the veins is the fact that the arteries have more layers. In other words, they have two, an internal and a middle um, elastic membrane to deal with that pressure. Now the vein doesn't need that because the vein actually has something even neater. He's got valves. Yes, veins 
have to get all the blood back to our heart, including from our feet, which you have to think about, okay, we're working against gravity. So how do we do that? I mean, we don't have, you know, hearts and our, you know, secondary pumps in our feet to pump the blood back up against gravity. Well, that's because your body is insanely clever. Veins are actually run through your muscles. So when you walk, you sit, you stand. You know, they say you don't, you shouldn't sit around for too long because, um, like some of us have the luxury to, um, but if you shouldn't sit for too long because it doesn't, you know, isn't good for, you know, your circulation. You should stand up and get your blood moving. Well, one of the things is when you literally are walking, the way the veins are woven through your muscles is your muscles contraction, contracting around your veins as you walk actually pushes the blood back up your body. So the veins being cleverly put through your, uh, your skeletal muscles actually helps push all the blood back up to your heart. Isn't that crazy? So that's why we don't have pumps in our feet. It's because our veins are cleverly woven through our skeletal muscles so that when we move around, walk, do anything, we're, on an, uh, we're just using that natural squeezing um, to move all our blood back to our heart. And these valves right here, these, they're like semi-lunar valves, um, they don't let the blood go back down because again, gravity's still at play. The blood is going to be like, Whoa. so that's why uh, veins have these valves built in every so often. So that prevents the uh, blood. Again, he can't go down. He only has to go up to the next one. So these valves prevent it from going with gravity down when we need all the blood to go back to the heart. So that's why the veins are actually really cool. They don't have the, the stretchiness that the arteries do because the arteries are dealing with really, really high blood pressure. The veins are dealing with barely any pressure. Um, but our skeletal muscles and these valves help get our blood back to our heart without having us, without having more hearts in like our feet or something to pump everything against gravity. However, this actually bites us in the rear end when we're in microgravity. Um, when we're floating in microgravity and gravity is not actually assisting moving everything around, a lot of our fluids actually get uh, piling up, up in our upper body. Um, it actually gets so bad that um, in the astronauts' heads, uh, it feels like they have uh, a sinus pressure constantly because all the pressure really isn't being pulled back down because of gravity. We do depend on gravity to help us move our fluids around just as much as we are cleverly using veins to get it you know, back up against uh, uh, gravity. So they actually uh, get so much pressure like in their head, it actually changes the pressure in their eyes of the fluid pressure and it actually messes with, it screws up their sight. So um, you actually have to, when you come back down to earth and you renormalize again, sometimes it permanently messes up their sight because they were up in space for so long with all the fluids, you know, being stuck in the top half of their body, uh, which is one of the reasons, this is just one of the reasons um, to alleviate this, they have to exercise constantly. So that's why you see astronauts exercising. The other reason is bone loss. Exercise is one of the main things that helps us against bone loss and being in microgravity for whatever reason makes our bones break down too. It's, it's really weird what microgravity does to our body. See, we, we are used to living on a planet with gravity and all of life has evolved because of, you know, working with and against gravity. So therefore, when we're suddenly put into not gravity, it's, our bodies are very confused and we've got to figure these things out if we want to go out into space and explore, you know, further away from our planet. Uh, how to mitigate some of this stuff so that way we don't lose all of our bones and turn into big, fat, plushy people in um, uh, WALL-E, because Pixar. I just love Pixar. Of course, Pixar movies always make me cry. Oh, especially the opening of Up. Oh my goodness. Anyway, so again, as you go down, it actually gets smaller and smaller. <coughs> oh, excuse me. <coughs> Well, I choke in my own spit. And so again, you see the three layers, definitely a large vein, then you got medium sized veins and you go into the venules. Uh, same thing, elastic arteries, muscular arteries, arterioles. Again, you'll see this, it, it still has that, that um, the elastic layers 
even in the muscular arteries. And then it goes down to arterioles, and then it goes down to capillaries. Now, capillaries are literally one cell thick, and that's a good thing because we want gas exchange to happen here. Um, and trust me, the less cells you have to get through, the better. Uh, diffusion of oxygen actually can happen naturally without the lungs, except we'd be dead before, <laughs> all our cells would be dead before it would happen naturally, which is why it's like, you see, you know, um, like amphibians, and, and they have to breathe through their skin because their lungs are not that great uh, for uh, air transfer. But, you know, for bigger ones that don't want to live next to water all the time, um, yeah, we need, we, we need lungs. So having the least amount of cells between diffusion, and we're going to talk about this again when we talk about um, breathing, when we talk about the respiratory system, same thing is happening in our lungs. We want as very few uh, obstructions between the oxygen getting into our blood and the carbon dioxide getting out. And the same thing with capillaries. Uh, so this is basically where the capillary exchange, again, this is working on pressure, but it's also working on osmotic pressure. So remember, osmosis is the diffusion of water across a membrane, if you recall from biology and last semester, because we touched on it like super fast. But anyway, um, so that's what's going on right here. It's blood pressure and osmotic pressure. So what's happening is these cells out here don't have a lot of oxygen. They really need that oxygen and glucose. And because of that, remember, high, you know, diffusion works on, you know, areas of high concentration wanting to spread out into areas of low concentration. So therefore, the water, oxygen, and glucose all get sucked out just simply through diffusion between the blood pressure and the osmotic pressure, which usually makes a net pressure of about 15 uh, millimeters of mercury. So again, that pushes out, but because these guys all push out, that makes a deficit inside, and therefore water waste molecules and carbon dioxide get shunted in. So again, it's just following diffusion principles or osmosis principles. So we're just basically using physics to get gases out and glucose out and, and shove gases back in. Because when these guys basically release their oxygen, they're primed to start picking something else up. And in certain, in, uh, they can pick up carbon dioxide, although most of the carbon dioxide actually gets dissolved into the uh, liquid part of the blood. Um, but sometimes, uh, also a lot of the time, these guys pick up some carbon dioxide and they only do it when there's no oxygen for them to have. And it's so they're, they're forced to pick up carbon dioxide. So red blood cells do pick up carbon dioxide, but for the most part, a lot of it just kind of dissolves into the liquid. And that's when we get into the kidneys. And, and when we talk about the respiratory system and we talk about uh, the kidneys, and we talk about acid-base balances, this is where that comes into play. So we're gonna talk about this first and then later talk about how carbon dioxide actually drives a very interesting dance of bases and acids in your blood to maintain a certain pH so you don't die. Technically, we're talking about all of this because we wanna learn how not to die. So anyway, that's the goal, I guess. Anyway, so. So there you go. So that's basically what the capillary exchange is happening. We've got, you know, blood pressure and osmotic, uh, osmotic pressure of diffusion uh, giving us our net blood pressure to basically push oxygen out into the hungry cells that want it and glucose as well. And again, back in again. And you notice water goes out and water goes in as well. Water is always going everywhere, which is why in the next chapter, we're going to talk about all the water that's going in, out, everywhere. And some of it doesn't always make it way, it's, its way back into uh, our circulatory system. So we need a system to kind of suck that up and put it back where it needs to go or else we'll get water trapped in strange places. So anyway, we also can constrict and relax our, um, you know, our uh, capillaries. So we got vasodilation and vasoconstriction. So when you blush and somebody says, hello, how are you? And you're like, oh, hello. And you like them and you blush. That's called vasodilation. It's also like when you get really, really, really hot or really, really angry or somebody does and they get like all of a sudden a huge flush of blood and your body's like, whoa, we've got way too much blood. We are got way too much heat. Open those suckers up. We need to lose some heat. So that's why you vasodilate. That's why you get red in the face is 
all the capillaries and uh, everybody else sits there and actually opens up. Now, the opposite happens too, vasoconstriction. So if you get too cold, your body and the circulatory, uh, circulatory system is ready to actually uh, kill off parts of your body to maintain the temperature in your core. Um, and that's unfortunately where you get things like, uh, you, know, frost, you know, frostbite to the point where you can get amputations because of it. Um, and that's vasoconstriction. So heat runs, you know, we, we move a lot of heat around our body. But we have to maintain, oh, I'm sorry, Monty, sorry. We have to maintain a certain amount of heat in our core to keep all our uh, organs going, especially all our vital organs that are in our core. So uh, if you get too cold, these guys actually will constrict to the point they actually shut themselves off. They, they completely, no blood is running through these at all. And because of this, all of these cells start starving because they don't, they're not getting oxygen, they're not getting glucose. But that's a sacrifice your body is willing to make to keep all your organs warm. So that's why you actually will start sacrificing your fingers and your toes, and it could lead to your hands and your feet if you don't, you know, get somewhere and warm up. And that is what vasoconstriction is all about. It's about protecting, you know, due to coldness and shutting everything down to keep your heat in a centralized, so that way we keep your organs, vital organs that keep you alive, but we'll sacrifice your fingers and your toes because we don't need them to keep you alive. So says the body. So that's vasoconstriction and how that can lead to like frostbite and whatnot. That's why frostbite can be pretty dangerous. So yeah, the body will actually sacrifice parts of itself to keep the main core organs going so that way you don't die in the end. You might lose some fingers and toes, but yay, you're not dead. So anyway, so vasodilation is when it relaxes and opens up and we get a lot of heat loss and we blush or we get red faced. And vasoconstriction is when it constricts and shuts off the flow of oxygen to certain and, and nutrients to certain parts to you know, preserve our life by preserving all our organs and our core and keeping the heat there. So anyway, blood pressure. So this is the force of blood exerts against the inner walls of the blood vessels. Blood uh, pressure circulates the blood. The term blood pressure is most actually referring to the pressure in our systemic arteries. Uh, like I said, we don't usually look at the veins. There is blood pressure throughout the vascular system. Uh, blood moves from higher to lower pressure throughout the system. Again, just like everything else we've been talking about, it's kind of like physics right there, like high to low pressure. Anyway, again, this is probably stuff you could teach me. <laughs> Some of you know this way better than I ever will. So, uh, so anyway, blood pressure, again, uh, we get the systolic over the diastolic pressure. It's usually in uh, millimeters of mercury. I have to work on my high blood pressure. Mine's a bit high, uh, but that runs in the family, unfortunately. And so, you know, you should be 120 over 80 and every should be shiny and wonderful. However, if you're low, you got prehypertension. If you're high, you've got high blood pressure. And unfortunately, I'm kind of working on this right now. I need to work on it a little bit more. You know, Monty, yeah. Because unfortunately, uh, yeah, my, my family, it runs in my family, so go me. Anyway, arterial blood pressure. So it rises when the ventricle contracts, falls when the ventricles relax. Systolic pressure, or SP, is the maximum pressure reached during ventricular contraction. Dystolic pressure, DP, is the maximum pressure remaining before the next ventricular contraction. Uh, pulse pressure is the difference between systolic and diastolic uh, blood pressure, so you subtract them. Mean arterial pressure map um, is average pressure in arterial system, represents average force for driving the blood uh, to the tissues. Yeah. So blood pressure is stated as a fraction, SP over DP, and blood pressure is stated in use of mill uh, millimeters mercury. Because mercury is an ideal liquid. Uh, it's not good for your body, which is why liquid mercury should be nowhere near you. Because unfortunately, it does the dumbest thing possible is it will absorb the mercury and go, I'm going to coat my brain cells in it. And then now suddenly your brain cells are now coated in mercury and now they can't talk to each other. And then you go crazy and die like the first emperor of China. That's what he did. 
and several other people, like mad as a hatter. Anyway, didn't I already talk about this? I might have. I'm sorry if I've already told you this story. I don't have anybody in the room with me to tell me not, except for Monty, and he doesn't talk much. Anyway, so cardiac output is the amount of blood that the heart can pump in one minute. Stroke volume is the uh, volume of blood ejected with each beat. Preload is the volume of blood lead to the ventricular stretch at the end of distally when it's got everything. And afterload is the amount of resistance in the heart must overcome to open up the aortic valve and push the blood volume into the systemic circulation. So that's why you always want a nice, healthy heart because if there's too much stuff on it. And it's interesting because when I, I, I give um, people sheep hearts to dissect in this class, um, they note that there's so much fat around the heart. And um, it's because it, they do, they have to shave quite a bit of fat off the heart. And that's normal. All of our organs are actually covered in a layer of fat. It keeps them lubricated. It keeps them protected. And that's normal. But too much fat, that wears and tears. And that's when you get, you know, your heart's having to work really hard to not only pump blood, but move all that fat that's accumulated all over it as well. So that's why we all have an amount of fat. There was actually a guy uh, that tried to argue and sit there and say he could get down to 0% body fat and live. He did not. He got down to 0% body fat and then he died of organ failure because like I said, our organs actually need a layer of fat on it for lubrication and protection. So basically all his, he turned all his organs into shriveled little shrivelly organs. Yeah, it was, it was a weird challenge. He was just like, I'm going to get down there and show you that humans don't need any body fat to live. Yeah, he proved himself wrong to death. Anyway, so again, again, some of you guys could probably do this math and slap me with it. So again, cardiac output, your average about 400 to 500 milliliters. It's the amount of blood pumped by each ventricle in one minute. Your heart rate, uh, number of contractions of the ventricles each minute, stroke volume, the amount of... Um, uh, blood ejected from each ventricle with each contraction. So again, factors that uh, epinephrine, so you know, you get hit with uh, adrenaline and then they'll pump through more because it, it, it activates your sympathetic and then you start going into fight or flight. Anyway, so blood volumes, nervous, uh, you know, sympathetic nervous system, peripheral resistance, the afterload. So if, yeah, if you have too much fat weighing on the heart. Also another problem like um, with um, giants, uh, like Andre the Giant, um, other people that are, you know, considered have giantism. Um, the unfortunate part is their body is huge, but their circulatory system is normal. So the part is actually kind of weird in the fact that they have a normal sized heart. So unfortunately, a lot of giants have to be very, very careful of their, of, uh, their hearts <coughs> because, and keep themselves athletic because their heart's actually doing double time, getting the blood around such a huge body. Um, and, um, and because of that, a lot of them die of heart failure. So giants, they may be huge, but their circulatory system is normal. So their heart has to do yeah, just insane amount of work, just to, like what a normal person doesn't have to deal with. So yeah, they may be a giant. They might be giants, if you get that musical reference, but their their hearts are normal. So you got to be very very careful about that. So anyway, blood volume and viscosity. So remember the sum of the volumes of plasma formed elements. We talked about that earlier. Varies with age, body size, gender. It's usually about five liters for adults. It's 8% of our body weight. Uh, blood pressure is directly proportional to your blood volume. So if you have low blood pressure, you might have, a, you might have sprung a leak somewhere. Um, like you wouldn't have known. Anyway, so any factor that changes the blood volume can change your blood pressure. For example, decreased blood volume due to hemorrhage decreases it. Viscosity, so difficulty with, you know, molecules of fluid flow past each other. So the other syrup, you know, like when you go to Cracker Barrel and you get the little things and they have the, the syrup's warm so it pours like water, but then you go home and you've got the syrup in the fridge and you pull it out and it pours like, well, syrup. It goes, Bleh. 
Yeah, that's viscosity. It's uh, liquids resistance to flow. So like cold syrup has more viscosity than hot syrup. So again, the same thing with your blood. The greater the viscosity, the greater the resistance to flow. So you do not want your blood like syrup. That's bad. <laughs> it makes everything go, uh, no. So uh, things that actually affect this, like anemia lowers concentration, lowers blood viscosity, lowers blood pressure. So that's why we take blood pressure. It tells us a lot of different things of what's happening in your circulatory system. Um, that's just a vital piece of information you can, uh, as you probably, like I said, you probably know more than me. Um, peripheral resistance is just a force of friction between blood and the walls of the blood vessels. Like I said earlier, that, that inside is very, very smooth because we don't want anything getting stuck. Because I remember when I talked about um, you get cut or whatnot and blood comes gushing out. Uh, yeah, if it's rough in any form or fashion, all those platelets are going to find and cling on to anything that's rough. And then they'll cling each other and instantly start forming a clot, which is not great. So blood pressure must overcome this peripheral resistance in order to flow. So factors can change your blood pressure. So vasoconstriction of arterioles increases your peripheral resistance, which increases the blood pressure. And when the blood is pumped out of the ventricles, the arteries, uh, art yeah, the arteries swell, which is why we have those certain layers of elastic around them. So um, the recoil sends the blood through the arteries. And again, that's why the arteries have to have that uh, elastic quality to them so they can deal with the swelling and relaxing swelling and relaxing without literally blowing a gasket because you don't you don't want to literally blow a gasket in your body not that you have a gasket but you know I'm just saying <laughs> line problems not good to have so again pulmonary circuit systemic circuit we kind of went over this I'm, I'm just touching on it again so you know Pulmonary circuit goes from right ventricle, pulmonary trunk, right and left pulmonary arteries, low bar branches, repeated divisions, pulmonary arteries, pulmonary capillaries, pulmonary venules and veins into the left atrium. Again, systemic circuit, so oxygen rich blue, uh, blood moves from atrium to left ventricle. Uh, contraction of left ventricle sends the blood throughout all the body. So left ventricle, aorta, all arteries and arterioles leading to body tissue, systemic capillaries, systemic venules and veins, and back to the right atrium. So there you go. Uh, just FYI, I believe this will also, you know, which way the pulmonary circuit goes and which way the uh, systemic circuit goes is, I believe, one question is going to be on that test on that. So and again, major arteries. Am I going to go crazy uh, yeah, on the major arteries? And Do you have to know all the arteries? No. No. Do you have to know all the major veins? Not really. No. I, I try not to go crazy about these things. It's like if you use them, you'll, you already know them, like in your line of work. So anyway, lifespan changes. Cholesterol deposition in the blood vessels, like I said, it narrows your coronary arteries. It also makes it not as slick as the inside of your arteries and your veins, which can lead to platelets clunking up and then, you know, all sorts of bad things. Heart may shrink slightly or enlarge due to disease. Proportion of the heart consisting of cardiac muscle declines. Increase in fibrous connective tissue of the heart. Increase in adipose tissue in the heart. Remember what I was saying. Every organ already has a layer of fat. That's normal. Unlike the one guy that tried to prove that wrong and paid with his life. Um, but too much makes it work too hard. Heart valves and left ventricular wall may thicken, which means, unfortunately, there's not enough room for more blood to get in. Increase in uh, systolic pressure, decrease in resting heart rate, lumens of large arteries narrow as arterial walls thicken. And again, arterial walls thickening is not good because, remember, they need to be flexible to deal with all that pressure. So if they thicken, they're not as flexible dealing with all that pressure. Something's got to give somewhere, and that's never good. And as I said, mentioned, decrease in arterial elasticity, as I was just talking about, which is not cool for you. So the way to fight all this, yeah, it's the same way to fight anything, exercising. Yep. All right, so again, Crash Course, he goes through a lot of this too, does a really good job with the visuals. I, I, like I said, I like him for his sense of humor and the visuals, uh, and the fact that they do a really good job. So they've got two parts on the blood vessels and, you know, blood pressure definitely in this one. So anyway, 
Highly recommend you watch those. And there you go. That's chapter 15. I hope you found it useful. And I'll see you later for chapter 16. See ya!